Hi, I'm Tonya Jenka, and I walk around a lot. I'm sorry, I should have warned you. So I'm going to walk the whole length of the stage. I'm that person, I'm that speaker. OK, hi, thanks for coming. This is called Purple is the New Black, which is I'm going to talk about modern approaches to application security. So I'm not going to talk about DAST and SAST and old stuff. I'm only going to talk about new stuff. And because you were just all day educated about the security of software, I feel like you're ready now for this. Um, this is the lightning version of this talk. This talk is one hour long usually, so I'm skipping out on definitions, on intros, and all of those things, and just jumping to the cool stuff. I even removed my, my rant about Mr. Robot, so I'm sorry. But anyway, okay, so hi. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about how modern apps need modern security approaches, so modern tools and modern tactics. We can't keep doing the things that we used to do because they don't work. Um, so the mandatory about me slide. So I'm Tanya Jenka on the internet. I'm known as She Hacks Purple. I like punk rock music. Um, I speak French and English. Uh, I'm obsessed with OWASP. <laughs> uh, I've run my own chapter and my own project. And one of my project team members is here, two of them. Um, I'm one of the founders of WOSEC, Women of Security. So if you're a woman, you want to meet lots of other cool female friends, that's us. Um, I'm part of DevSlop and I give training. Woo! Okay, so now hopefully you're like, she is so qualified. I should listen. Thank you. It wasn't just the bribes of the stickers I gave you earlier. Yes! <laughs> so there's more stickers after. Um, okay, so usually I would do definitions, but we're not doing that because you are all already experts after yesterday, plus I don't have enough time. So this sticker, so whenever I don't know what to do, I tweet out to OWASP and I tease I'm shining like the bat signal into the air and then the community comes to help me. So an artist drew this for me to represent like my relationship with OWASP. And now we're gonna talk about, so it's called purple is the new black because I am a purple teamer. And that means I do defense, which is blue team, and I break shit all the time, <laughs> which is red team. Uh, and together that makes me a purple teamer. And I believe application security is essentially like embodies the idea of purple team. You have to do both sides of the equation. So what does the purple team do? Modern stuff. So the first thing I want to talk about is zero trust. So what we used to do, I, I know this is networking, but now that we do DevOps and developers no longer just write code and then toss it over the wall and are, are, it's kind of like a grenade. They're like, haha, ops, that's your problem. So now we're doing DevOps, now we're doing more modern ways to develop software. Ops and Dev actually speak to each other. Sometimes people do both those jobs. Um, now we need to know a little bit about networking. So what we used to do is we used to do zoning, which meant sometimes it just meant drawing on a network diagram and not actually doing zoning, because I used to be a pen tester, I know that. <laughs> so, so when you see like a network diagram, don't believe it. But anyway. <laughs> You would put some stuff of your network, so let's say all your databases, there'd be a database zone, and all your databases would be in there, and you'd have this nice firewall around it, and then you'd have all your apps, and there'd be a firewall around that. And so if someone like me got into one of those zones, it's like shooting fish in a barrel the whole time, because everything's open. So we would trust everyone in our zone, but now we're zero trust. There's no zones. Everything is an island unto itself. What does that mean for apps? It means, so within our apps, sometimes we can't trust other parts. We have to check first. It means between apps. So if I have two apps that need to interoperate or integrate together, they need to authorize each other and check. And they need to verify the data that is exchanged. If I call an API, I need to authorize myself and authenticate myself to that API. It can't just be like, oh, she's in the perimeter. She's probably fine. No. <laughs> We have discovered from so many breach reports about like people living on people's networks. If we do zero trust, then that means they break in. They have to break in all over again to talk to anything else. And then they have to break in all over again. And it just means that if someone gets into your network, it's a lonely party for them. Um, this goes along hand in hand with assume breach. Some people say that it's the same thing. I like to think they're slightly different. But when we design things, we design as though we're going to assume that at some point it's going to be breached or it might have already been breached. So let's say uh, you run a bug bounty where you work. If someone submits something to your bug bounty, you launch your incident response process. 
let's assume we've been breached because we found there's this vulnerability. Someone was smart enough to find it. Maybe that person was the third person to find it and not the first, right? So this is a new way that we are designing things that basically are like, we can no longer assume like if you're inside the perimeter, you're our buddy. Even sometimes these things are by accident. Like I have seen developers just call an API the wrong way and then everything just goes downhill. But if instead that API had validated the input, it wouldn't have crashed, right? So assume breach. Okay, next, serverless and logic apps. So I'm gonna explain what they are, then I'm gonna explain like things that we already all know, and then new things. I'm gonna do that on each slide. I'm not doing it to be condescending, I'm doing it because if like 10 of you don't know what a logic app is, then this slide is useless for you. Um, okay, so a logic app's like a trigger. So let's say um, someone has tried to log into my server 10 times in one second. That's probably not a person, right? So I will have it trigger, a, it'll call a logic app. Logic app, the only thing it does is it's like this behavior happened and then it calls a serverless app. That's all it does. It's just like flick. And the serverless app is a small teeny tiny app that does not need a server. Ah. But really what it does is it's like a script or this little tiny app that does not exist on your network and then it explodes a container, it runs itself, and then it self-destructs and disappears. So you can run a serverless app for a penny or less sometimes. What this means is it's not running all the time. It's ephemeral, it disappears on you constantly. And so you can have logic apps that call serverless apps or serverless apps, you can trigger them in other ways, you can call them directly, et cetera. But I like to pair them together for lots of reasons. So we need to do all the same AppSec things we always do. For some reason, people running serverless apps a lot right now are like, it's 1999, I don't need to validate input. Yes, you do. <laughs> all the things that you would normally do with an app, you still have to do it. Right now, lots of bug bounty people are like, this is the best ever. I just like watch and I see one flick up and then I know what to look for and the next time it comes, I'm like, boo. And then they're getting huge bounties. Don't give them the bounties. <laughs> do good AppSec. Okay, so next. Oh, so, and by good AppSec, I mean we should monitor and log functions. Uh, and by functions, I mean serverless apps, sorry. I'm from like the Azure world and they call them functions. <laughs> we have to log them, monitor them, use, just do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Like for instance, like it should be HTTPS, like it should be encrypted on the way, yeah. But bonus, use an API gateway. So it handles all your authentication and authorization for you. Nothing can talk to it unless it goes through the API gateway. It's like a big gate in front and nothing else can get in except it goes through the gateway. Awesome. So we're monitoring and we're logging our fun functions, right? Do we log it to nowhere? A lot of people do, I'm so not kidding. <laughs> I used to work somewhere once and we had like this daily email that would come in to tell us that the app was up. Guess what all the developers did? We made a folder and we had to automatically go there and then we never knew if the app was up or not. <laughs> that doesn't work, so we have it go into the sim now. Um, we wanna put our secrets in a secret store. I'll talk a little bit about secret stores, but basically your secrets should never go in your code, we know this. If you put it in your database, that's a lot more complex than just putting it into a place where its entire purpose is to manage your secrets. So we access them programmatically instead of directly. And we wanna deploy our functions with minimal granularity. So don't have a serverless app that does 500 things. Have more serverless apps. They don't cost that much more. Um, and then it won't be running all the time. Like separating out your functions is better. And lastly, so this says maintain isolated function perimeters. So I wanna thank Sneak because I read a million of their papers to come up with all these things, but specifically this one. Um, if you have an app and it calls an API and it's like, oh, I will make sure that I'm authenticated and I'm authorized, awesome. And then it calls another API. You still have to do the same thing with that one. You're not like, we're in, it's fine now. We are, we're trusting, we're friends. Like everyone's doing that. If an API calls an API, all the same rules still apply. That's what that means. Okay, next. I'm, at, I'm halfway through. You, you were like, Jeff at the back was like just adjusting and holding the paper. I'm like, oh my God, I have five minutes. No, okay, everything's fine. Okay, so third party component and library management. So this is the supply chain of your software. So all the libraries, all the dependencies, all those things. When you put them in your app, if they're insecure, your app's insecure too. 
So we know that's bad. A lot of people call this open source security. It doesn't matter if it's proprietary or open source. Like .NET's not open source. I still don't want to get NuGet packages that are insecure, right? So I just wanted to point that out because everyone seems to be confused. Um, okay, so I think, so every vendor here is gonna be either really excited or really upset about this advice, but I think you should use more than one tool. They all have different teams that look for things in different ways, they check different lists. If you only use one tool, you only have one perspective. If you can afford two tools or, and by that I mean like have enough resources to install and monitor and use them, but also money, I feel two tools is better than one. Also, scan your repository regularly because a thing might become out of date or become like a, vulnerable, a vulnerability might start to exist. But then also, scan in your pipeline because you might be coding something and you're like, okay, I'm gonna upgrade to the newest NuGet package, but sometimes the one above you is actually insecure, which is really weird, I know, but you don't want to accidentally release something wildly insecure actually onto the internet. So if you check in these two places, life will be so much better for you. Okay, next, online storage, the crown jewels. We all have heard like jokes about like open S3 buckets on the internet, um, but Amazon was like first the cloud. So they made some mistakes, but they've learned, all the cloud providers have learned from that. And so now things are locked down by default. You can create templates for your organization so that everything is closed by default, period. I'm a huge fan of templates. I never want to do something twice. And I don't want to have to like threat model and risk all these hundreds of things only to have the next team have to repeat all of that. And I pay a consultant two times. I'm really cheap. <laughs> um, also classification of data. So all of the clouds and most of the major databases now, you can classify your data. As someone who has done a lot of instant response, if I could know right away, oh, this data is actually all available on the internet, but we are afraid a breach happened, I'm just like, I can breathe. No more like big new streak of gray hair. <laughs> but if, if, you, if it's not labeled, I have to assume the worst, right? And so you can have different logic apps, triggers, that trigger based on the classification of your data, but if you don't label it, you don't know. Um, so not only do we want to monitor them, we want to set up file integrity monitoring. We want to have alerting that actually goes to the SIM. I cannot tell you how many places I've gone in and they're like, yeah, we totally monitor all this. No one's looking at the monitoring results. There's no alerting. There's no like email that gets sent. And it's like, oh yeah, we did get breached like months ago. Look, it's all in the logs no one looks at. So in the cloud, this is way easier. You can like just hook all this stuff up, but you can do all of this on-prem. You really can, you just have to be more crafty. Um, and lastly, for online storage, like not your iPhotos, <laughs> but like for online storage for your apps, only service accounts should access them. Lots of places I have worked and someone has quit and everything is in their name and suddenly nothing works anymore. You don't wanna have a human being's account, you wanna have a service account. And the other reason for that is is because when I look at logs, I don't wanna see, oh, Tanya did that at four in the morning. Because if Tanya really did that at four in the morning, there's a problem. But if that app called this because this customer did that in the middle of the night, that's okay. Does that make sense? Thank you for the nods. Okay, so containers and orchestration. So containers are like a teeny, teeny, tiny version of an operating system, just the amount that you need to run your code. And they are separated in a slightly different way but basically, instead of having two gigs for Windows, you have four megs for a container. Like you can run an app with almost nothing. And orchestration means manage that stuff for me. <laughs> like start this, kill that, destroy this, launch this, etc. So orchestration is the management of a whole bunch of containers. Score. Okay. We still have to do all the network stuff that we're doing. So we should design this with zero trust, right? <laughs> We should do all the proper things that we would do. But on top of that, so it's sort of the same, but with different tools. So there's new configurations, but it's kind of the same. Like there'll be new commands, 10 minutes. New commands and new rules to learn and new tools. Like so you, use a diff you don't use Nessus necessarily. Maybe you use Aqua instead. But the point is, is that you still need to scan everything that can be scanned, 
There's new types of vulnerabilities, but they'll still be vulnerabilities, right? The main thing with this that's the most important is to protect who can create or edit containers. That's like the keys to your kingdom. That is the most important thing to protect in regards to this. And basically scan all that can be scanned, follow the same like cloud security, network security rules that you would. And um, well, basically zero trust. So follow the best practices that whoever makes your containers has told you. And I know that there's sort of just like one group that most people use, but whatever you choose for your containers, read their hardening guide and then make it your religion. Okay, next, APIs and microservices. API stands for Application Programming Interface, but basically it's an app with no front end. So it still does all these appy things, but there's no front end. As a pen tester, I can still talk to it. <laughs> and I can talk nice to it, or I can talk not nicely to it. A microservice is an API, but it just does one single tiny thing. It just runs off, you know, you give it a postal code and it comes back with the street address and that's it. It doesn't do anything else. So microservice is like, I just do one thing and API is like, maybe I do a few things. But I, both of them have no front end. For some reason, people forget that AppSec still applies. It still applies. You still need it. You 100% need it. But there's more. Um, so APIs and microservices can use something called service mesh. It's a layer of infrastructure that just handles all your encryption end to end. It's so lovely not to have to handle that yourself. All the cloud providers have one, and then there's some that are agnostic that you can just use anywhere and you can use on-prem. Use service mesh. Um, standardization or templating for your org. I have worked so many places where all of the APIs get called in this brand new way. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, strict linting. Uh, so I've also worked at places where, you know, you could call, so um, part of the OWASP DevSlot project, we have some microservices, and you can call them in the wrong way. So like you could do, you could call it with a get, but then you do a delete command. And it's like, okay, no, 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 no. Be very strict with your grammar. So linting is like grammar checking in Word, but for code. No poetic license, follow strict coding guidelines. And Throttling and resource quotas. So, like I said, a human being can't log in 10 times in one second. So if that happens, then they can only log in once per minute. And then maybe once per hour, and maybe they get cut off. Or if someone from the same IP or the same behavioral, you know it's them, you know it's the same person, don't let them keep logging in every minute for four days. Right, that's still a brute force attack. It's just a slow kind of dripping, brute. it's still bad. We wanna authenticate and then we wanna authorize. This goes for everything, but especially for these. For some reason, again, it's 1999 in regards to security when people make APIs. Mm. Um, don't give extra information that you don't need to give. So if you're gonna give an error message, just be like, wrong call, the end. Don't say, oh, it was supposed to be like this. I've seen a lot of APIs respond and they're like, oh, this is our format, well, thank you. <laughs> um, and lastly, this goes for like every web server. Make a list of HTTP verbs that are allowed, which is always get and post. <laughs> um, and then block every other call. Don't let them call head, don't let them call every other one. I think there's like 10 or 11. Okay, my app, no, you're not raising a thing. Cool, modern tooling, five minutes. Or 10 minutes or five? Five, okay, cool, six. Okay, so this is new types of tools, and then we're gonna talk about new type of tactics, and there's gonna be very little overlap, but some, because I like things a lot, so I say them twice. Okay, one, I asked, interactive application security testing, so this is a new type of thing that vendors would like to sell you, and it works differently. Um, SAST goes through every single part of your code as though it's executed. Well, this only runs on things that have actually executed. Most code actually doesn't get executed in your app. Like you write it just in case, but in reality, most of it doesn't actually happen. So this just does what happens. Real-time application security protection, or sometimes it's called runtime, depending upon who you ask. RASPs are not a fancy WASP, or WAF, like I call it. <laughs> Basically, it works in a new way. Again, it's like a stub that goes into your app and then goes, that looks bad, no. 
it's kind of like a, like a WAF in its goal to block bad input, but it actually executes it in a very different way. File integrity monitoring, which goes hand in hand with application waitlisting. Um, basically, if you put that on your servers, no one can install malware because if something gets downloaded, it won't run. And then if it tries to change its name to a file system name, which is what malware likes to do, it'll say, no, you can't change that file. Cloud native controls. So these are security controls created usually by the cloud provider or by a company where they've adjusted their tool or created their tool only to work in the cloud. Those work better than the old tools because they're adjusted or made specifically only for the cloud. I won't make a list because we'll be here for a few days. Um, adding security tools to your DevOps pipelines. Customizing alerts and automated responses. There are tools you can buy to do this. If you have a giant group of devs, you can get some of them to do this. Application inventory, external monitoring, external snapshots. I don't know what to call this, but this is like a new area of AppSec that is kind of exploding right now where they just check on your app for you and tell you if stuff is bad. Okay, tactics. Adding security tools to your pipeline. <laughs> um, negative unit tests, so taking the developer's unit tests and adding payloads, bad code on purpose to make sure that your application fails gracefully. Breaking security activities into sprints. If the developers are sprinting, we could sprint along with them. Um, we can't keep doing things the old way where we're like, oh, we'd like to do a three-week code review. Could all of you just stop working? No. <laughs> um, turning pen tests into unit, thank you. Turning pen tests into unit tests. So um, you probably have your devs work on a whole bunch of your different apps and they make the same mistake in all of your apps. So if you have one pen test done, you can take those results and turn them into unit tests for all of your apps and find the same problems. Um, Tuning your tools for automation and efficiency. A lot of the old AppSec tools just don't put them in a pipeline. Everyone will hate you when it takes six days to complete your pipeline. Um, everyone should be scanning their, their code repositories for vulnerabilities and for credentials. It's like this, a lot of them are made for this now, but they didn't used to be. It's so good. It's such a good win and you don't annoy anyone. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of other, like basically for the rest of today, this is what you're gonna hear, is different ways that we can be more modern in our approaches. So with that, oh, I'm not gonna talk about DevSecOps because I don't have time, but, oh, and I'm not gonna talk about cloud security, sorry, because I'll talk about cloud security all day. But the summary of these are this, and then I'm gonna just give you some free resources and then if you wanna ask questions, it'll be after outside because we're running out of time. So if you're gonna keep your cameras out, here are some free resources for you to learn more about all of these things. So um, OWASP, join OWASP. Who here comes to OWASP meetings? Yeah, one day I wanna see all the hands. Our, the, our conferences are the best. You know because you're here. If you're a woman, consider joining WOSAC, Women of Security. You can make lots of cool female friends, so you're not always the only woman everywhere you go. Um, every Monday I do this thing on Twitter called Mentoring Monday where I pair people with more senior people and help them join our industry. If you are experienced in an infosec, there are so many people that wish they could learn from you. Sending someone an email, a book suggestion, or just responding to them and encouraging them is the thing that might bring them into our industry. And lastly, me, I'm a resource, follow me. <laughs> I have a blog and videos and all sorts of things I put on the internet for free because I want us to move forward as an industry and because I like ranting, as you can tell. And I believe that is the last one. So with that, what have we learned today? We have to modernize because developers and ops are modernizing. They're not gonna hang out and wait for us. Neither are attackers, right? <laughs> Um, and I want to thank all of you for your time and attention today. I really appreciate you coming. Do we have time for one question? Probably not, eh? We do have time. We have a break right now, so we oh. do have, so you can either choose to speak with oh. our yeah. lovely speaker, Tanya, or we do have a break outside uh, downstairs in the vendor area, so it's up to you, but again, cool. As she says, you know, oh wasp. I mean, please support. I'm so glad that you're here. 
But uh, you know, if you're senior, reach out. If you're junior, reach out. Please reach out. There's a lot of people in this community that are willing to help and to tutor, mentor, whatever we need to do. So yeah. this is a fantastic organization. Yeah. So. Yeah, we want you to join our industry, and we mean it. And also, please feel free to take stickers on your way out. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody.